Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about the concept of adaptation as it relates to products and promotions in international marketing. Uh, I think we've all, many of us have heard of the stories and the, the horror stories of taking a, an existing brand name or uh, messaging or even a particular product and trying to uh, take that standardized product and launch it into a new country without any adaptation. And uh, we've heard of uh, countless examples of failure as a result of this. So I think we're, our sensitivity is higher and uh, I wanted to give you some examples that I've run across or that I've been able to run across um, uh, personally uh, that, that can help shed some light on this, this concept of adaptation. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into this. Um, one of the things that I'll be doing is um, talking about product adaptation. I'll talk about new product innovation in an emerging market, and then I'll talk about promotional adaptations as well. So this may run, again, a little bit longer than uh, other presentations, so feel free to stop and, and stretch your legs. Let's start it off with a little fun activity here. Uh, McDonald's is one of the best uh, organizations at adapting its product globally. So here you can purchase a seasonal New Year meal that includes a grilled chicken burger and curly fries accompanied with a horoscope of the 12 zodiac animals of this country's astrology. Is it China, Vietnam, or Japan? Final answer. China. Many of us who've traveled to China uh, uh, or uh, lived in China or come from China know that uh, the zodiac animals are extremely important as a part of the culture and we'll actually see this in another example that I'll show you in a second. Number two, in which country are the Maharaja Mac and Makalu Tiki Burger served? And t uh, aloo is a is potatoes. So there are your four choices. Final answer, and the answer is India, with I think twenty five to forty percent of the Indian population being vegetarian. Offering a Big Mac with beef patties is not acceptable in that culture. So the Maharaja Mac is the alternative to a Big Mac, and the Mikalu, if that's how you pronounce it, the Mikalu uh, is a, a tiki burger, uh, sort of catering to the, the tastes of the tiki marsala um, uh, uh, heritage from that country. Last question. Which country, uh, in which country does McDonald's feature a filet o ebi consisting of a shrimp patty and mustard? Final answer. And the answer is Japan. So what I wanted to do here, well, first of all, if you got them all right, give yourself a round of applause um, and uh, we'll move on. What I wanted to do was sort of whet your appetite for what global product adaptation is and how we might see it in, in a regular example, and then give some other examples. Let's say, for purposes of this class, that global product adaptation is modifying an existing product, and that could be um, uh, the feature sets or the particular capabilities, maybe it's the packaging. Think of all the attributes of a product, uh, ingredients, uh, that, that could be altered in order to make it more appealing to a local culture. And that gets to local, uh, sorry, global product adaptation. Here's an example of one uh, that I came across in Suzhou, China uh, this year. Uh, here was my chicken dish that I ordered along with a soft drink. And I noticed that almost all dishes in China, in the KFCs in China, were served on a bed of rice. And more often than not, there are a significant number of vegetables um, uh, provided, much more so than you would see certainly in the States. 
Uh, so think in terms of unique types of vegetables that you would see in, in China, for example, tree fungus, and that might appear in a salad. Um, typically, the outlets, the KFC outlets, are two to three times larger than American outlets, which surprised me because of the cost of real estate in China. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, um, they're trying to account for the larger crowds. And many of them are open 24 hours a day, and they do provide home delivery, which I thought was something we should be thinking about here in the United States. And uh, here, the, the dish that I was served on the left, you can see on the right here, uh, they actually served a plastic glove along with the dish so that you didn't get your hand messy as you ate the chicken. And so there I am modeling my plastic glove. I want to play for you a video here uh, having to do with Oreos in China and how they have made significant product adaptations here. Why change it? For Kraft, the answer was simple because after bringing the Oreo to China in 1996, sales started to sag. We started to do some research and said, gee, you know, I'm not sure everybody really likes this, this yeah. American version, which is quite sweet. So we started testing alternatives, and it took us a long time and a lot of prototypes because we were trying to get exactly the right balance. Lorna Davis heads Kraft China. She says remaking the Oreo helped double sales in two years and made Oreo the number one selling biscuit in China. That first variation on the original, one that looks the same but is less sweet. And here's the biggest rip on the original, the Oreo wafer stick. We discovered that the wafer market was very, very big here in China, and we didn't have an offer in wafer. And consumers really liked Oreo, but actually they like wafers. So we launched this product, which is a chocolate coated wafer, and it has, uh, it comes in a in a in a prepackaged product like this. And in 2006, this was the biggest single SKU, or biggest single item in China. It's the product that made history for Kraft, not only because it's so different from the original, but because it's the first product developed in the China market, and now sold in Canada, Korea, and Australia. I like the big front place. The hope is this kind of entrepreneurial spirit in local markets will spur Kraft's next big sellers. Automatically, people just loved it. Yes. Let's go this way. You can tell it's an Oreo. It may look different. It tastes like an Oreo. Yeah. That says a lot for our new people because she managed to create a coated wafer product that still tastes like an Oreo. That's really impressive. From there, the number of variations grew. White chocolate covered wafer sticks, a cookie lined with cream that can be used as a straw, and a super long wafer cookie. The wafer sandwich, so you can see it behaves exactly the same as an Oreo. You just have to take it apart, and of course it's extremely dunkable. Kraft also came out with a smaller and more affordable pack of cookies. So one of the things we found was that there were many people in, uh, in China who really liked Oreo, but their absolute available, available money at any time was not enough for a full pack of Oreos. The full pack of Oreos here is about 70 US cents. Um, so this pack is 35 cents, and it does particularly well in the second and third tier cities. So even that pricing difference, selling something for 35 US cents versus 70 US cents makes that much of a difference in sales. A very big difference. And to get consumers to try the new Oreos, a promotional blitz from in-store samples, which often result in immediate sales, to commercials that showed consumers the traditional American way of eating Oreos. From twisting the Oreo apart and licking the cream to dunking them in milk, all of it foreign to the Chinese consumer. And what I think is important with Oreo is that the ritual is on the surface of it about cookies and dunking into milk. The reality is many people, even Americans, don't dunk it. But it's a moment of connection. It's a moment of, of, of fun between parents and children particularly. What I think is interesting about that video is that it covers three different types of adaptations that the product's going through in China. First, think in terms of a formula change or a formulation change. They said that uh, the Oreo was made less sweet for the Chinese audience. Uh, so here they are adapting the ingredients. Think also of line extensions. 
They showed wafers, uh, wafer, uh, uh, I think they call them sandwiches, um, and they had the, the straws. Uh, so they've taken the concept of a new product introduction and, and rolled it out according to the unique tastes uh, and, and customs, I guess, or I guess just tastes of the Chinese consumers. Uh, and lastly, think about the packaging adaptations that were made in conjunction with pricing that they mentioned in the very last example of taking a pack size down from 70 cents to 30 cents uh, and reducing the quantity of products in that package. So three good examples of product adaptation there in this video. I want to also show you one that I came across, I was very fortunate to come across uh, in a study abroad class this January. We were the first student organization to visit Shanghai Disney, which is still under construction. Um, and uh, we were, I was, and I think we were very impressed with what we saw there because of the attention to detail that they, Disney, the Disney folks are making to adapt this product to the Chinese population. The mantra that they used over and over and over was, we want Shanghai Disney to be authentically Disney and distinctly Chinese. Um, so um, here we are, and uh, all, all you really need to know is that the groundbreaking began in 2011. It's expected to open in 2016, if not the end of this year. This will be the first ever Disney resort on mainland China. And uh, those of you who perhaps have, have studied the Hong Kong Disneyland case, or know about Disney, you know that the initial launch into Hong Kong back in 2005 was not particularly successful. The park was too small, they hadn't paid attention to many of the local customs, and they hadn't tailored this park to try to adapt to the Hong Kong population as well as the mainland China population coming over to visit it. So with all of this in mind, uh, the Disney folks began to tell us about some of the adaptations they are making to the Shanghai Disney Park. Um, first of all, they'll be uh, rolling it out in three phases rather than just an initial launch. So you can see the three phases there. They have also began to begun to adapt the uh, hotels, the rides, the amusements, um, and some of the other elements of the park that I'll show you here. What they are counting on is significant stakeholder involvement in the decision-making process. I've listed a bunch of the different stakeholders here that they specifically made us aware of, and it's interesting how they, they look to each of these stakeholder groups as a real opportunity for information flow into the product design and also information flow back out into the marketplace once uh, something has been, has been accomplished. I'll just call out one of these. They made a, a, a big show of talking about their workers. They said that there were 100 to 120,000 workers on the site of this facility on a daily basis. And so they are actively marketing to the workers in order to make the workers aware of the uh, uh, attractions and amusements that they're putting up, the um, new information about the park, because those workers would then take that information back to their homes and to their networks um, and, and spread the word. And as uh, we are starting to learn about China as a country, there's a very strong social network around, built around relatives and close uh, friends and family members. So Toy Story Hotel, picture what that would look like in America, in China. The adaptation they, has, they have made is to turn it into a, basically a figure eight. If you look closely at this, tilt your head and look, you'll see that um, the, the hotel is built in the, in the figure of an eight. And eight is a very uh, good number for the Chinese because the pronunciation of the of the word eight is very close to the pronunciation of another word and I think it's fa please correct me if I'm wrong on that uh, just posted to, to go for whole um, which means uh, good fortune uh, the in the uh, Enchanted Castle will be the largest of all Disney castles we were told that the Chinese are very proud uh, in um, in, in being the first or the biggest uh, whenever they can be. And so uh, to have the largest of all Disney castles would be bragging rights for Shanghai. Uh, 
Uh, it will represent all of the Disney princesses, not just one, uh, more of an inclusive nature. Uh, and it will also be the first castle to have a ride inside of it. The PowerPoints I'll put out on Moodle. If you're interested, you can take a little virtual ride on the, uh, on the ride itself uh, once I post the, the PowerPoints. That's in the lower right-hand corner. They will have a theater called the Lion King Theater. Uh, this is a, uh, an Art Deco theater that will uh, be premiering the Lion King show, and it's all in Mandarin. Uh, and, and this was uh, explained to us in order to recognize the importance of opera and theater in the Chinese culture. They felt it was very important to have um, a, a uh, entertainment venue like this. In addition, we're back to the Zodiacs. They, they will have a garden of, it's called Garden of Twelve Friends, and it will be a very large park that will feature Disney characters and mosaics that represent these Zodiac characters um, on the grounds. Little things. They're uh, customizing the cast member name tags to contain Chinese characters. Disney characters will wear the local apparel. Um, and the, uh, this is such an important aspect of, uh, of, of Shanghai that they, are, uh, they have a separate subway stop for this particular location, and uh, the design of this stop is being voted on by the public. I think there were seven or eight designs that were submitted, and they're out on the Internet, and now the, the public is voting on which design they want, and, and then they will design the subway around that. So the takeaways here are, it's this concept of um, blending Chinese cultural elements with the imagination and the abilities of the Disney folks. And I'm back to that brand mantra, which to me is very close to the concept of taking a brand and making it global. Uh, the brand mantra being, of course, authentically Disney and distinctly Chinese. If you want to take a break, this might be a good time, uh, but if not, here we go. So uh, when I was over in India, I had the good fortune of sitting in on a presentation that was made, uh, and I want to kind of review just two or three important points of this, and this gets to the heart of how you would develop a new product in an emerging marketplace, especially India. So if we look at a developed market like, let's say, the United States, we generally have a pyramid that uh, shows very strong representation in the high end that could be price or that could be uh, affordability index. So generally, products, new products that are developed for uh, markets will tend to have more of an appeal towards the higher end um, uh, segment of the market versus the lower end. In this particular presentation, uh, oh, and I should say that the, the rationale for this is higher discretionary incomes exist there. We are more highly educated in, in uh, certain uh, developed markets, and we have less sensitivity to pricing. And so therefore, a lot of times we're trying to develop products to that higher end as a result of this. What they said in the presentation was we need to, if we're in an emerging market, flip that pyramid. And we have to think in terms of the greatest opportunity for us being at the lower end. And this is, of course, due to much lower income levels. Sometimes in some countries, we're talking about a dollar a day as a per capita income. Very little formal education may exist in some of the emerging markets. And there may be uh, uh, transportation issues or infrastructure issues or isolation issues in these tier two, tier three cities that are further out from the major urban centers. And therefore, the question gets asked, how do we account for all of these factors, lower income, less education, uh, the, the, the infrastructure issues, and there might be different buying habits. And I want to give you an example or two here. But before I do, Let's talk about um, how a new product would be developed. 
Well, if, if, we've, if we're back to that upside down pyramid with the high end occupying most of it, the developed country new product uh, profile would be more innovative. It would be feature rich. We'd be looking for this new whiz bang feature or maybe an app or something that connects with it. Um, and we tend to think in developed countries at, in a more disposable fashion. So they're going to get rid of the old one that they have, or they're going to get rid of some replacement, and, and this is what they're going to buy. And we would focus on the higher end tiers. In emerging markets, we have to flip that. We have to think about very basic innovation. We would have only the most basic features offered. And this concept they kept calling defeaturing, so you know, stripped down to the very the, the the bare essence of features that people want. Uh, in some cultures, there is a high degree of pride around being able to repair something or fix something in a very innovative way. Uh, and I've forgotten what the word is um, over in India that they use, but it's this concept of, for example, if you're trying to fix a, a bicycle and uh, you have uh, you know, a spoke that's needed or something, someone who could engineer a spoke out of a uh, car spoke or um, um, an umbrella bracket or something like this and, and turn that into an innovative way of solving the repair issue, that gets props in, in a foreign culture. Uh, and then also the lower end tier affordability. So when we were in India, we noticed over and over and over that the cell phones people were using were nothing like the ones we were using in our developed countries. And they were embracing this concept of defeaturing. They were stripping down the functionality to only those items that were necessary. And in this case, it was text and voice based services. Um, and here's a here's a phone that is a defeatured phone. Uh, in addition to the text and voice based services only, there's a uh, talk time up to seven hours. There's only a speed dial list of eight entries. The pixel resolution uh, is, is much lower. And then there's a couple of smaller aspects or, or sorry, features that they would include. But in general, this was a stripped down defeatured product in one of the more popular phones that we saw in India. How much do you think you would pay for this if you were in India is a question I would like to ask you. Think about that for a second. You know, I mean, knowing that our phones, if we purchase a phone, it's, you know, 200 bucks with a plan. But if we didn't have a plan, it might be, I don't know, 500, 600 bucks. The cost of this particular phone, uh, the Vodafone 150, is uh, 16 US dollars. So um, we're talking about a significant difference in new product development in emerging countries. And defeaturing is an important part of this. Another term we heard a lot of was frugal innovation. And that's a good way to think about this. How can we frugally innovate for this emerging market country? Now let me talk about some global promotional adaptations. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples. I'm going to give you three basic ones just to move this along. But think in terms of how we might have to modify our promotions to adapt to this new audience uh, or the, the country audience that we're, we're targeting. So global promotion and adaptation would be modifying a promotional effort. And I'll define that as the messaging for the promotions, the media choices, and also brand elements. So this could be uh, tagline, colors, spokes characters, etc. And we're going to try to make those modified so they're suitable for this particular market. A couple of examples. In Sweden, all television advertisements aimed at children less than 12 years age uh, are, are illegal. So think about this if you are marketing a cereal or um, uh, some sort of an adventure or maybe a theme park to a 12-year-old or younger individual in Sweden. Television advertisement is off the table. Uh, and as I mentioned before, some brand elements have to change. Uh, here in Sweden, Ronald McDonald cannot be employed in any McDonald's ads because they have very strict rules about spokes characters uh, influencing um, uh, the population. In Germany, uh, one of my students brought this to my attention, there is no direct comparative advertising allowed. So next time you're watching television, see how many ads actually compare themselves to the competitor and we're better for this reason or that. That is not allowed in Germany. So you would have to change your messaging in order to uh, comply with that. 
Um, and lastly, I'll play this for you. This is a, uh, a video that shows um, how Apple adapts its messaging uh, in four different countries. Show me my book list. You have four book reminders. Montre-moi ma liste de livres. Vous avez quatre rappels dans la liste livre. Zeig mir meine Literaturliste. Du hast vier Erinnerungen auf der Liste Literatur. Du kriegst dann sie Kredit. Kriegst du doch die Wahl. Da ist. Tell dad I found Katie's present. Dir hat Papa geschickt Cadeau d'Alice. Sag Papa, wir haben das Geschenk für Julia. Vous devez être mit qui date tes amis cette année. Here's your message to Dad. Voici votre message à Papa. Here is your message to Papa. C'est un action à l'acheter. C'est un action pour sa message. Il fait moi côté Daft Punk. Je suis pas un Daft Punk. Play some Daft Punk. Here's Daft Punk. Monde de l'immense talent. What time is it in Australia? If it was in Australia. Okay, I think you get the idea here. If you want to watch the entire spot, uh, feel free again to watch it through the, the PowerPoints. But here's a very basic way of adapting language um, and uh, to, to across a, a, a platform or a, a campaign platform. The very end of this, um, they also show the the women, there are four women who are speaking in the very beginning of this, they show the four women um, and representing each of the different cultures, which I um, think is a, uh, an interesting way of, of changing the, the message. Back to your global marketing text readings that we had in week one. Um, there was an interesting matrix that was presented here and um, by a gentleman who originally did this called Keegan and then I think Keller and, and Kotler featured this in one of their texts. But it's an interesting way of thinking about how you might have to adapt product and promotion um, and, and the variances or I guess the, the different ways that that could happen. So for example, across uh, one axis, the, the, we've got product and the other we've got promotion or communications. And for each of these situations, it shows us how we would have to adapt a product or uh, adapt communications and maybe adapt both of them. So last example I want to give to you, another one that I saw in India. And to me, this was distinctive because it, it, it crossed the whole promotional mix. It just didn't focus on product and promotion. It focused on product, promotion, uh, um, pricing and distribution strategies. So uh, here we are. We had just finished this presentation at Godrej, which is a very large Indian company that manufactures um, health and beauty aids and cleaning supplies and things like that uh, in Mumbai. Uh, as we were in a presentation, this gentleman in the uh, second from the left in the front there, he kept talking about sachets. And I had never heard that term before. And I looked around and no one else was going to raise their hand. So I just raised my hand and I said, I'm sorry if we stop in things here, but can you tell me what, it, what is a sachet? And he began to explain the concept of a sachet being an adapted product for shampoo in the Indian market. So with that as sort of a lead in, here's what you need to know about India for the, the rest of this conversation. Uh, again, we see annual income levels significantly lower than what we would be used to in a developed market. Uh, the frequency of shampoo usage is extremely low in India. In fact, we were told that sometimes Indians will not wash their hair uh, except for special occasions, or they may wash it just once or twice a month. So now we've got a population cultural custom or value that's quite a bit different than what we're used to in the United States. Last thing we need to know is 94% of all retail sales occur through these very small mom and pop stores or independent stores. Um, it's not a very good picture, but if you look at the picture, you can see that the square footage of these stores is you know, significantly less than what we'd expect, even in a corner grocery store in South Minneapolis where I live. 
um, and, and product is stacked to the ceiling in these stores. And it also hangs from the ceiling, and you might be able to see that right in this counter area there uh, if you squint. But um, keep that in mind as, as I roll this concept out for you. So we've got issues of um, population differences in capital income. We've got differences in usage among the population. We have uh, significant differences in the distribution of this product through the stores. And the last thing I would say is there are road systems that are highly undeveloped in India. I mean, literally, and I'm not joking, literally, a, a VW bug could disappear in a pothole in some of the country roads that I saw in India. So you have significant problems transporting pro product out to tier two and tier three cities in India. Keep that in mind as well. So what Godrej began to talk about was this concept of a sachet. And a sachet is really nothing more than think of a ketchup packet with, with shampoo in it. A very small, one-use product that's, I'm guessing, maybe two ounces of shampoo. And it's, they are also uh, manufactured in a lot, uh, uh, lack of a better term, you know, like a, a packet of 50 of them and they're perforated but they still are connected. So what an individual would do is walk up, tear off one of those, purchase that as a single serve, be on their merry way, and the rest of the 49 packets still hang from the ceiling. Uh, so as a result of this packet, think about less storage needed on the part of the retailers. Think about less weight being distributed or transported across the lower infrastructure quality system that we saw. Think about um, a convenient way to merchandise this by hanging from the ceiling. And think about a price point of five US cents uh, per packet. So here is a product that is designed specifically, almost built from the ground up like was recommended to us in this other presentation we saw, uh, taking into account the local uh, consumer's different needs uh, and the channel of distribution and the pricing needs. So to me, this was sort of an aha moment as an, uh, you know, an American, sort of like, whoa, I have to really think differently about marketing when I think about marketing products to emerging markets uh, as new products. So the key takeaways, I think, for this sec section are uh, pretty obvious, but that is that this adaptation or the customization is vital when we're thinking about uh, local uh, launches of products. Number two, we, there are a huge amount of variables we have to account for. This little example of the sachets takes into account several, but I'd be willing to bet there were even more variables that they had to account for as they were developing that product. So we have to think in terms of breadth, and then we have to think in terms of depth when we get to the product line and how we're going to deliver that uh, so that it meets the needs of every stakeholder in this equation. And the choosing that right mix, uh, price, product, place, promotion, requires careful study and constant insight gathering so that the population that we're serving is uh, not only the consumer population, but the trade population is served well. So that's what I wanted to cover today in product and promotional adaptations, and I hope you enjoyed it.